Good afternoon, all, and welcome. It is my absolute honor and pleasure to, to introduce um, Leo R. Chavez, who is a distinguished professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, Irvine. In addition to scores of academic articles, he is the author of Shadowed Lives, Undocumented Immigrants in American Society, covering immigration, popular images, and the politics of the nation, the Latino threat, constructed immigrant citizens and the nation, and anchor babies, and the challenge of birthright citizenship. His current research examines the effects of political rhetoric, especially anti-Latino and anti-immigrant rhetoric, on emotions and psychological well-being. On another note, Leo um, has been a mentor to hundreds of us um, who have had the privilege to study with him at UC Irvine. Um, Leo was on my dissertation committee, and while there, I did direct his um, Center for Latinos in a Global Society. And Leo, um, I can say that that your work has influenced me directly, and that and that I've used to, to teach both to teach both um, graduate students, um, scholar activists, activists, and undergraduate students. Um, without any further ado, Leo, the floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to thank the um, <laughs> Haven's Wright Center for inviting me again. I wish it was another time so I could come and actually visit Madison because I hear it's, it's really a nice place. Uh, and uh, I want to give a shout out to Armando. As he said, I worked with him when he was here at UC Irvine, and uh, he's done really well despite that. So that's, that's really great. I'm happy <laughs> to see how, how well you're doing, Armando. And I want to thank uh, Patrick Barrett for all his work on the logistics of getting this this done so that we have, have this event today. So thank everybody. I'm looking forward to uh, the Q&A and um, I'll present a little bit of my work. Uh, so thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and um, uh, let me see here. And so, you know, my talk, as you've already sort of heard, is, is called Latino Presentimiento and Anti-Immigrant Populism. And um, so I'll try and keep it within a reasonable time frame. When we think about resentment, it's, it's sort of a common set of responses, uh, uh, emotional responses to an experience that is real or imagined um, to an injury or an injustice that one feels, and often is associated with emotions like rancor, bitterness, acrimony, anger, ire, and indignation. Adam Smith believed that resentment had great power because unlike anger, which can be assuaged, or envy, which can be sated, resentment is often a kind of woundedness that never heals. And this is an important idea, it's, it's something because of your emotional response to this, this resentment, it, it sort of stays and festers for a long time. I, I draw on Didier Fasson, uh, uh, who complicates this idea of resentment, and he tries to break it into two different ways of thinking about resentment. One he calls resentment, and the other one he uses a French term, he is French, called resentment, in order to make a comparison to see a, you know, how resentment can be thought of in different ways. Resentment, as he used it, and I use it, uh, is relational. It's relational. It's, it's between this and this. So that, for example, his examples he uses in his writing is, is the resentment felt by the police, the far right, unemployed workers. Basically, people who find themselves opposed to others who they grow to resent and blame for the position they themselves are in. You know, we might use the term scapegoating. But the idea is that those who feel such resentment, resentment are typically not oppressed directly, but are unhappy about their lives. They see themselves in a position of less mobility in society than their parents. The idea they'll never achieve as much as their parents for whatever reason. 
They see themselves and people like them experiencing demographic decline, which is typically attributed to immigration and the demographic growth of minority populations. And, uh, but this, this demographic growth has losers and winners, and they often see themselves then on the losing end of that demographic uh, growth. They see themselves as in jobs that they don't really like, they aren't the kind of jobs they were dreaming of. Um, you know, society has changed in the kind of jobs that people experience. And so they, they feel unhappy in the kind of jobs that they have. And they find that other people in society, they believe, are getting preferential treatment. That, you know, for various reasons, they're getting ahead and they aren't. So there must be something going on that the government or society is, is giving them some preference that they're not getting. So in other words, this kind of resentment is, is a belief that, that people are losing out in relationship to others toward whom they direct this resentment, this anger, this rancor. And they typically direct it towards vulnerable groups and undeserving others in their point of view, ethnic and racial minorities, immigrants, and their children. Barbara Ehrenreich wrote about this idea, which I think it reflects what I'm trying to get at here, when she wrote that, all of this means that the maintenance of white privilege, especially among the least privileged white has become, whites has become more difficult. And so for some more urgent than ever, poor whites always had the comfort of knowing that someone was worse off and more despised than they were. Racial subjugation was the ground under their feet, the rock they stood upon, even when their own situation was deteriorating. This basically frames a lot of what uh, fascinated than what I'm talking about in terms of what resentment is. This resentment, this anger, is often very much uh, uh, usable by populist po po politicians and media pundits who use this anger to stoke fears in society about other groups coming in, particularly immigrants and, and ethnic minorities. And so populist politicians, right-wing groups, media pundits really develop a, a rhetoric of fear that stokes resentment. And it also fans the flame of anti-immigrant rhetoric. A couple of quick examples. I don't wanna take a lot of time. Uh, this guy, I should have probably given you a, <coughs> a warning. You know, here's Tucker, Car Tucker Carlson. And he said, he's always ranting about immigration. Here's just one of his quotes. You know, we're getting waves of people with high school education or less. Our leaders demand that you shut up and accept this. We have a moral obligation to admit the world's poor. They tell us, even if it makes our own country poor and dirtier and more divided. I, I could have given you a lot of quotes, but uh, that was just one. Laura Ingram, on, another pundit on television says, in some parts of the country, it does seem like America that we know and love doesn't exist anymore. Massive demographic changes have been foisted upon the American people and they are changes that none of us ever voted for and most of us don't like. So she's basically reflecting resentment. David Stringer, a Republican in 2018 wrote, immigration today represents an existential threat to the United States. And quote, there aren't enough white kids to go around. Resentment, demographic change, coming out in the losing end of growth in America. So resentment is, re is, is a really clear set of ideas that you know, you're losing out, somebody else is winning, and you resent that. Resentment, the French term, is different. Resentment is related to a history of oppression and, denomination, and not domination that people actually experience. So resentment is a reaction to historical facts which generate an anthropological condition. Victims of genocide, apartheid, or persecutions experience this condition, according to Fassett. And so it's not, a, it's not a new term. Frederick Nietzsche used the term resentment to discuss the malcontent of oppressed people, colonized people, to separate it from resentment, to understand the emotions that come out of being the victim of oppression. I use the term resentimiento, which is a Spanish term, and it has a lot of the similar sense of resentment. It basically reflects ideas of emotions of disgust, bitterness, hurt, rancor, and or anger at mistreatment by hostile words and or acts. And for me, it's, I'm talking about the kind of hostile acts uh, conveyed in negative political rhetoric. 
that, res that creates a sense of emotional resentimiento. Now you can contrast this, and I think it's really important that resentment can underlie anti-immigrant and anti-Latino rhetoric. Resentimiento points us to try to understand what it means like to be the target of that rhetoric. So the two, you know, I'm trying to get at two different ways of approaching resentment here. You know, I talked about the political rhetoric of, of resentment a lot in my book called The Latino Threat. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I kind of want to get to what the, the next section of the talk. But, you know, so just to kind of be clear, resentment and anti-immigrant sentiment really go hand in hand in the discourse around immigrants as criminals, which is not true. Latinos are unassimilable. They don't want to be part of the nation. They only want to speak Spanish, which is not true. Latinos take from US society and don't contribute, not true. That Latina fertility is out of control. That Latinas will always have lots of kids. They'll never change. And this rhetoric is part of the rhetoric of resentment about immigrants and demographic growth that is part of a rhetoric of a Mexican invasion and reconquest of the Southwest. So that Latinos and Latinas are blamed for demographic change and the idea that whites are being replaced in American society by many groups, but particularly Latinos. This is an old trope. It goes back to the 60s when you had Paul Ehrlich at Stanford, biologist writing about termites and population growth. And you know he used Mexicans as, as, simple, as sort of a top way of talking about current day at the time, termites who just can't control their fertility and burst out and create undocumented immigration to the United States. The popular press picked up this and helped stoke resentment towards immigration from Mexico. Time bomb in Mexico, why there'll be no end to the invasion by illegals. The time bomb, of course, is like the population bomb. It has to do with fertility. Invasion from Mexico, it just keeps growing. We just had witnessed an invasion from Russia into Ukraine with tanks, guns, all kinds of things. This is an invasion, but there's no tanks and no guns, but you notice they're carrying a woman across, right? It's an invasion by people who are gonna create families, take over neighborhoods, and eventually take over the United States through fertility and demographic change. U.S. News World Report kind of follows up on this idea with the disappearing border, why Mexican migration will create a new nation, because they don't come here to be part of our nation, they come here to take over and create their own nation. Time Magazine, wrote about the browning of America in 1990 and had a flag representing the United States where the whites, white parts of the flag are being squeezed out by people of color. And the idea that there is what happens when whites lose out on demographic change. So, you know, you see this over and over and over, you know, wanted more babies. Why the end of the population explosion is a mixed blessing. Too many Latino babies, not enough white babies. Samuel Huntington jumped in on this, you know, how Hispanic immigrants threaten America's identity, values, and ways of life. And he, he focused on demographic growth and fertility rates. And so this, you know, that continually you have the target of this resentment at perceived changes and being left out, focused on Latinos coming into the United States. Hispanic Business Week 2004, Hispanics are an immigrant group like no other. They're changing old ideas about assimilation because they don't want to assimilate. They don't want to be part of America. And yet the picture here looks like somebody just went shopping at Walmart. I don't understand the contradiction there, but it's kind of interesting. Then you have the issue of anchor babies that emerges in the, in the early 2000s. And the idea that the children of immigrants who are undocumented parents are a problem and we should cut out birthright citizenship. They become the target of a very vitriolic political rhetoric that questions the citizenship of children with undocumented parents, accusing them of not being citizens like the rest of us, of being cheaters, being part of a conspiracy. I mean, I'm not gonna dwell on all these. I just want you to say, this is a few books I have on my desk to show you how deep this resentment literature and resentment against Latinos is in the popular discourse. The Disunited of America, Arthur M. Schlesinger, the quintessential liberal writing about the threat of demographic change in Latinos. Samuel Huntington from Harvard, Who We Are, The Challenges to America's National Identity, focusing on Latinos. Invasion, Michelle Malkin, a right-wing pundit, how, Amer how America still welcomes terrorists, criminals, and other foreign menaces to our shores. You know, it's so you make a lot of money on these books. So many of these authors write multiple books just on the same topic. Michelle Malkin again, Open Borders, Inc., 
who, who's funding America's destruction? You'll see the classic border of, of immigrants crossing that down at the border, primarily focusing on Mexican immigration. Americans no more, the death of citizenship. Mexifornia, a taste of becoming, how Mexico is taking over California. Pat Buchanan has written at least three books on this topic because it's so, it's, you can make money on it basically. How dying population and populations and immigrant invasions imperil our country, our country and civilization, the death of the West. State of emergency, the third world invasion and conquest of America. Tom Tancredo, former congressman, mortal danger, the battle for America's border and security. Jim Gilchrist, Minutemen, focusing on Mexican immigration at the border. And you know, basically it's, it's a manifesto for vigilante groups that have emerged in large numbers since then. Then we have Donald Trump and his populist appeal where he retweets the, the typical parts of the Latino threat that you know, I've been talking about for, for a long time, that immigrants don't wanna assimilate, they don't wanna speak English, they don't wanna be part of the nation, They're, they take our jobs and their children create a problem for the future of the United States. And he really, he really ratcheted up the anchor babies discussion and the need to get rid of the 14th Amendment birthright citizenship. And of course, his first day of running for president, he had the famous quote, which I don't even need to probably read because everyone knows that, you know, he claimed that Mexicans are, are druggies, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, uh, and maybe a couple of good people. And so what we have then is him, you know, using his populist approach to fan the, fan, the flames of resentment. But resentimiento, on the other hand, is, is an idea that I build on in the research that recognizes that political rhetoric can elicit strong emotions about how people feel about being the target of all this resentment in political rhetoric that is so constant in our society. And so my questions became, that I wanted to understand was, after having written Latino Threat and other, a lot of other things that related on this, I really wanted to know how does it feel like to be the target of negative political rhetoric? And how do the targets of political rhetoric respond to that? And so I developed uh, an idea around what I saw as, and this is a quote that kind of reflects what I see as, as this question. You know, in 2018, a woman in, uh, approached in Running Springs, California, not too far from where I live here, actually, uh, uh, Esteban Guzman, who was a US citizen, and his mother, who were just gardening out in the front of in the yard, and told them, go back to Mexico, and unleashed other anti-Mexican rants. And Guzman asked, why do you hate us? And she replied, because you're Mexicans. And he said, we're honest people. And the woman laughed and said, you're rapists, drug dealers. Even the president of the United States says you're a rapist. And Guzman says, thanks to him, Donald Trump, everywhere I go, I'm a rapist, an animal, a drug dealer. You don't know what it, what it feels like to be hated so much. That's the idea. That's the purpose of the study I'm gonna talk about is you know, what does it feel like to be the subject and the target of so much political rhetoric? We, I did an experiment, had a lab, had people come in and see negative and positive uh, political rhetoric and, um, and ask them a series of questions, but two basic questions. How do you feel when you see these statements? And what do you think when you see these statements? And they could write down as much as they wanted to, one word, paragraphs, pages, whatever they wanted. And, and then we asked some standard psychological questions. Just to kind of give you a sense of the response, this is sort of a, a, you know, a, a web a cloud uh, of key words in their responses. And you can see here, just a whole bunch of ideas pop up that they express themselves. And um, you know, of course, the work of an analyst is to, is to kind of code these. And so basically, this is the code that we develop for these sentiments and emotions that the student, one group would look at the negative political rhetoric, one group would look at the positive, not they didn't look at both. And just to kind of give you a sense here, you know, basically almost half of the people used emotion, expressed emotions of being angry, upset at this rhetoric. They were sad. Uh, they were attacked and targeted, they felt. They were annoyed and irritated. They were offended. There was a lot of hate, they said. They were disappointed that people felt this way. They were disgusted. They felt terrorized by the rhetoric. They felt fear. They were scared. They felt ashamed, degraded, insulted. And so, you know, some simple 
examples of political rhetoric sort of, in a sense, triggered all this rhetoric they had framing their lives on an everyday basis. And you'll see here, I have abject stigma and physical reactions as, as grouping together many, uh, what I saw as emotions reflecting those kinds of ideas. So that, for example, what I found was that, you know, negative rhetoric can really hurt, which is the title of, a, is of our paper that came out in Social Science and Medicine, Words Hurt. And, um, uh, you know, participants who viewed the negative political rhetoric we showed them included words in their reactions that you just saw, sad, upset, angry, hurt, offended, and feel bad. And just to kind of give you an example, this was a quote from a 24-year-old Mexican-American woman student here who, who, who responded with anger, rage, frustration, impotence are just some of the words that come to mind. I have so much to say that I am not able to properly articulate what I'm trying to say, much less express myself in a healthy manner. These types of regressions are not new to me, so, what, so I know what it's like to have these words and images being shouted at you and making you feel out of place, ashamed and inferior, even though you were born in the United States. I wanna frame some of the responses around two concepts, stigma particularly, and because the us them nature of negative political rhetoric objectifies an outgroup, which is targeted by the rhetoric. Irving Goffman noted that stigma is a word that referred to the markings once burned into the skin of criminals making them outwardly visible as morally polluted and thus to be avoided. For many of the responses of the people who we showed did this experiment with, this is the kind of, they felt the stigma. They felt that they were being represented as polluted in society, as not belonging, and which reflected another concept, abject status, which means to cast away or to throw away. And it's, I think it's related to stigma because the abject has always been used to describe those in the lowest, most contemptible, and most wretched social status, which this political rhetoric seems to do. It refers to a set of practices that marks off or brackets a group as different, degraded, unworthy, illegitimate, and undeserving, which a lot of this rhetoric, particularly about anchor babies, was all about. These rejected and abject subject, subjects in, inhibit, inhabit a liminal space where the boundary between their lives in the nation and their lives as part of the nation is maintained as a way of ensuring their control and social regulation. And so these two concepts come together in the way people talked about their lives. And here's a little scheme, schematic I put together, abjects, stigma, uh, uh, emotions of you know, unwanted, being thrown away, overlooked, disregarded, disrespected, dehumanized, outsider, foreigner, not belonging, undeserving, that came up. These emotions and, and ways of expressing their response to the political rhetoric came up in, their, in these, these young people's uh, way of talking about it. And you know, I'm not gonna read all these, but you can just kind of see if I just take idea of being unwanted and throwing away, you can kind of look at some things people said. Oh, the idea of being overlooked, disregarded and disrespected. Here's, you know, here's another quote. And, and over here's another quote. I, you know, it take too long to read all these, but you can kind of skim through that real quickly and just see that you know, people really felt that this rhetoric it stigmatized them that made them feel like they were outside the nation, outside of, of, of who belongs here. The other grouping I put together were physical reactions because people responded in their, in their quotes that basically reading, seeing the negative political rhetoric was like the assault on their body. They physically felt numb or they had no feelings. They felt hurt, shocked, disheartened, confused and pain. They, they felt sick. They, they couldn't think. It was like being punched in the head or being punched in the gut, right? And, and so this physicalness, the actual you know, corporality of, of political rhetoric, I thought was important to kind of highlight here. They also came up as that word cloud kind of symbolized at the beginning, a whole series of critiques. So on the one hand of your brain, you have your emotional side, on the other hand side, you have your rational side. And I'm, I'm trying to show how the responses captured both of those parts of the brain. On the one hand, the emotional response. The other hand, the rational critique of the political rhetoric. They said, many people said that, you know, the, the political rhetoric singles out an ethnic group, theirs, filled with generalizations, basically racist. 
They don't doesn't recognize that people why people migrate to seek a better life. That's full of ignorance and stupidity, inaccurate, untrue stereotypes, judgmental, discriminates, um, and you know a whole series of discussions of why the rhetoric was basically false. And so I thought that was really important to see how just by showing people some simple political rhetoric, you can capture emotions and strong critique at the same time. Well, what happens when you show people positive political rhetoric about Latinos and immigrants? Look at these words. These words are almost the exact opposite of what this group were responding compared to the group who saw the negative. They had words like proud, persevere, positive, empowered. And you know, so we, we coded these and it came out that you know, these were key words in their responses that they expressed. So positive political rhetoric can have very positive emotional responses from people. And so, the, and so just to kind of affirm that, you know, people wrote with words of being happy, being proud, that they see immigrants are a benefit, they felt empowered because of this positive rhetoric, uh, they felt part of a community. As one young woman wrote, as a Mexican American, I feel proud reading the quotes and seeing the images. I feel very emotional because the present day individuals discriminate not only against immigrants, but their children. I am glad to see that we are contributing to society and wish Americans could see that. I wish that they can see we are not harming, quotes, their country, we are helping it grow. And so you know, this kind of positive response, feelings, emotions, and critique was really interesting. Um, we also did basic psychological measures for stress, perceived health status, and perceived sense of well-being. The, the kind of model I, I developed was that political rhetoric affects your emotions, which in turn, emotions become the mediating force between psychological uh, uh, feelings like stress, subjective health status, and subjective well-being. And we tested that in, in a paper that's more quantitative than what I'm presenting here. You can look at it, it's called Words, Words Hurt, came out in 2019 in Social Science and Medicine. And um, uh, we looked at then, we showed an experiment, this positive and negative political rhetoric. And we asked the positive and negative affect schedule, which look, to look at the kind of emotional impact viewing these kind of, this kind of rhetoric had on each individual who, who looked at it. And so the PANAS, as it's called, provided an index of positive and negative emotions felt after viewing the rhetoric. And I'm not gonna, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna simplify this, but I just wanna say we tested this with, with regression analysis and found that political rhetoric does affect both positive and negative PANAS or emotions significantly. And then those emotions, positive PANAS and negative PANAS also then <laughs> affected the, is statistically perceived stress, subjective health, and subjective well being. To simplify this, let me just put it this way exposure to negative political rhetoric significantly raised stress levels compared to those who viewed positive rhetoric. Exposure to negative rhetoric significantly lowered perceived health status. People felt sick compared to those who saw positive or neutral political rhetoric. They just, they felt, as I said and pointed out, their bodies felt assaulted, which made them feel actually ill. It significantly lowered their perceived well-being, their sense of, of being in the world, of belongingness. Negative images and words can hurt, we found out, and tested statistically, but positive political rhetoric can have a healthy effect. It made people feel better about themselves, as we saw in the quotes. Exposure to positive political rhetoric significantly reduced stress levels compared to those who viewed negative rhetoric. Their stress levels went down seeing positive political rhetoric. Positive media rhetoric related to Latinos and, and immigrants significantly increased perceived health status compared to others who saw other types of rhetoric. They felt, they felt healthy, they felt strong, they felt good. It increased their percent, the perceived sense of well being in the world, of belonging. So I came to realize that how we talk about each other in society really does matter. If we talk negatively about people, they feel bad, they feel stigmatized. If we speak positively about people, they feel good about themselves and their sense of belonging in the world and the community. It's such a simple idea. Talk about people in a way 
to get a certain kind of response that will be beneficial. Let me conclude because I'm talking about emotions here and I'm talking about critique, but you know, negative political rhetoric also has some material impacts we can't forget. We always have to remember that. What we say matters in a societal sense. You know, as I've demonstrated here for decades, we've talked about an invasion, right? And these are the people who are invading and destroying our country. Donald Trump used between May 2018 and August 2019 in, on Facebook ads, the idea of an invasion, the word invasion, 2,200 times. Those words matter. Decades of using the enemy trope for people coming across that border makes a difference. For example, on August 3rd, 2019, Patrick Crucius killed 22 at a Walmart in El Paso, Texas. He had to drive all the way down there to kill them. And why did he do it? Because he had heard there's an invasion and he came to the defense of an Hispanic invasion of Texas. So there's a real material consequences for this rhetoric. Individuals feel sick, feel bad, feel out of place, feel targeted, but it can have larger you know, repercussions. And let's just take the Chinese flu rhetoric. You know, think about what's happened with the anti-Asian uh, American rhetoric and, and hate crimes. Just look at the hate crimes in our major cities against Asians, right? In 2020, that orange line, this spike related to them being blamed, targeted of a negative political rhetoric related to the flu. So material consequences of what we say are incredibly important, right? When you have a 339% increase nationwide related and, and sort of demonstratively related to a political rhetoric, it's, it's just amazing. So my conclusion is that scapegoating and blaming immigrants and Latinos for demographic changes and Asian Americans for the pandemic may get some votes. You may get listeners to your talk shows, um, but the cost is really great to individuals who suffer psychologically from that and from the goals of creating a unified nation. If we want to create a nation, let's think about how we talk about people in our nation. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much to you, Leo. Um, all right. So now we have plenty of time for uh, Q&A. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this procedure, but nonetheless, I'm going to go over it. Um, we're going to take questions in, in groups of two or three. Uh, there, and there are two ways you can ask a question. So first, you can raise your hand virtually. And to do that, you notice at the bottom of your screen, um, at the very far right, there's a reactions button. So once you click on that, you can click on the raised hand icon. And I'll call your name at that point. The other alternative is to raise your hand, or excuse me, your question into the chat. Uh, and I'll read it out for you. So if you're going to ask a question yourself, uh, I'm going to ask you to turn on your video. So um, having said that, let's see if we've got anybody who's interested in raising a question. And don't be shy. Well, I've got a question of my own and while other people are thinking of theirs. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, Leo, because I've been, you know, there's a lot of coverage in particular, say, in the New York Times about, you know, electoral developments, and they're doing surveys of people. And one prominent example is along the border, uh, the South Texas border with Mexico, that there's a claim out there, and I'm wondering how you evaluate it, that one of the consequences of this, perhaps, is that growing numbers, numbers of Latinos who have been here perhaps longer are themselves growing to become more anti-immigrant, um, that they're opposed to immigration and they see the, a divide between themselves and those who are more recent arrivals. Um, I'm wondering what you, how you evaluate that and whether, you, whether you, research you've done yourself jibes with that or if it does, um, you have your own understanding of what's going on there. Well, you know, that's a nice, you know, I read those pieces too. I think um, there are places in South Texas where you do get a more conservative uh, vote. And uh, uh, a lot of it has to do with even a change in religion. People, you know, often becoming more um, evangelical movement is, is big among Latinos in the United States oftentimes. And, you know, despite what the Republicans often say about Latinos being um, it, 
genetically Democrats, you know, immigrants are relatively conservative people, um, you know, because often they're coming to escape poverty or oppression. And, um, and a lot of the values they express oftentimes tend to be what might have been classic conservative values in America, you know, family, home, religion, children, future. And so they can be relatively conservative, but I, it looks like it varies a lot by state. Southern Texas seems to have a little more conservative trend going than say California, which is the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, you know, why it gets influenced at local level like that, it's really hard to say. You know, traditionally, when we talk about stigma and we talk about the idea that this in-group, out-group and, and certain people targeted, that's always been a wedge issue in, in, in the Latino community. Um, because, you know, it, the kind of rhetoric I'm talking about paints with a really big brush. It's like everybody's bad. Everybody's stealing jobs. Everybody's illegal. Everybody's this. And the first reaction would be for people who our citizens or been here for multiple generations is, you know, we're not undocumented. In fact, many of us have been here before uh, Anglos came to the Southwest. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, why are you painting us in the same stick with the same stigma as everyone else? And so it, when, when you have a rhetoric that, that targets a, a group, so in, with such generalities, um, I think there's a sort of a na almost a natural reaction to say, wait, that's not me. You know, why are you saying that? And it may create a certain amount of resentment as well in that. I remember back in the 50s when we didn't have that much immigration in the United States and in California, we had Operation Wetback. So you had people, Mexicans and their family being picked up on the streets in Los Angeles. At that time, most people who were here of Mexican descent were US citizens by birth. And so here you have the media talking about Mexicans destroying our economy, being picked on the street. And everyone else saying, well, wait a minute, you know, we're born here. Why are they, everyone looking at me like I'm a destroying your society? And you know, this is, so it's, it's an old divisive problem actually. Uh, and stigma, that's one of the basic problems with stigma. I think that people don't wanna be associated with people who become stigmatized group. Right, right, thanks for that. Okay, so uh, anybody else interested in asking a question or offering a comment? And again, there, you can do it in two ways, either raise your hand virtually with the reactions button, or you can type in a question in the chat and I'll read it aloud. So again, don't hesitate. Well, I kept my talk short, so make sure we have plenty of time. So <laughs> it looks like uh, you have one from iPad123. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. He's raising um, his hand. Okay, it's somehow not showing up on mine. Um, well, go ahead. I'm going to ask you to unmute iPad one, two, three. Hi, it's Michael Olmick from um, Ed Policy Studies and Sociology. Um, I have one comment follows from what you said in another and a question. Um, I remember reading. Uh, an account that when there was the effort to, uh, I don't know if it's Operation Wetback or whatever, but that Mexican Americans from El Paso actually participated in setting up a, um, a chain to stop people from, uh, is it Juarez, coming across the river. I found that shocking. But my question is, do you know anything about where Mexican immigrants in the US largely get their information, their news? And the reason I'm asking is, um, I asked a Latina woman, uh, whom would you, she asked me who you're gonna vote for and, blah, blah. and I, I asked her back and she said, well, Trump and I, Oh my God. Um, now, I think it may well have had to do with abortion, but she said something that was astonishing. She said, Trump cares about immigrants. And I was like, what is she listening to? Is there, is there a great deal of right wing um, whether it's TV or radio or, or going into Mexican immigrant homes? 
Thanks. Yeah, I mean, there is actually. And um, uh, you know, Latinos get their information just like everyone else does. And it, and it varies by generation. So that if you're a lot of the second generation, third generation, and even the immigrant generation are basically being, you know, um, uh, talked into evangelizing and becoming um, part of the uh, Protestant sects in America. And, and they get a lot of their information from that. They get a lot of what I would call misinformation. Uh, and uh, if you're you know, basically a Spanish speaking immigrant, you get a lot of your information from the church and you get a lot from um, uh, radio rather than other sources. Uh, and um, so you can be just as misinformed as anyone else in the country. It's not that hard, uh, unfortunately. Um, and, 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 you know, like I said, a lot of Latinos can be conservative. They listen to Fox News. They listen to the same channels of misinformation as, as everyone else. And so they can, you know, they can get their views uh, along those lines. Uh, fortunately, uh, I think many, uh, the polls show, don't follow that level of, of support for Trump because it's clear that his, his immigration ideas do kind of go against um, uh, people who feel their families are under assault by the immigration policies that were put in. But just to be clear, I think, you know, that once again, a rhetoric that's divisive and, and, and tries to divide people who are legal immigrants and citizens and say, you know, it's really the undocumented or illegals who are the problem. And you should be concerned because they're gonna take your jobs, right? They're gonna destroy uh, everything you're working for. They become uh, some, a threat to your way of life. It is, people can buy into that really relatively quickly. I mean, I interviewed, I was doing Shadow Lives many years ago. I interviewed a guy, he was about a 60 year old uh, legal immigrant from Mexico down in Chula Vista. And um, he was telling me how this new wave of people from El, El Salvador and Honduras and Guatemala were coming in and taking jobs. And, and he said, you know, this is, we really shouldn't let all these foreigners in to, to kind of take away the jobs that we deserve. And I said, well, with all due respect, some people might call you an immigrant and, and a foreigner. He goes, yeah, but I was here first. And I think, you know, people of all backgrounds can buy into the sort of classic American trope that, you know, that um, it, you once you're in the door, you can kind of close the door on someone else <laughs> because now you deserve to be called, uh, you know, a, a native almost or, or someone who's here before other people who are in the rhetoric become this threat. And, you know, you when you talk to people, you find those ideas all the time. Um, and I would say, given if you talk to any Latino, uh, they'll talk about their uncle who listens to Fox News all the time, or their aunt who goes to an evangelical church who's anti-immigrant. And um, it's probably as much of a divisive issue in Latino families as it is in any other family in America. And, and unfortunately, you know, it's the source of information and misinformation is doesn't have um, doesn't ask for a passport. It hits every community and everybody and every family. I hope that answers your question. It's it's it's, it's you know it's, it's a very difficult thing for many families who you know you think they would all you know they aren't all on the same page when it comes to immigration. They have other priorities often: family, kids, education, jobs, um, and um, and so how they think about immigration can reflect about their vulnerability in society and related to new people coming in. Um, and so you might find Mexican immigrants who aren't that, you know, like I was pointing out, who aren't that um, uh, pro Central American immigration because they might see it, it's been presented to them as a threat to them, right? On the other hand, we're in a, we're in a time period where because of education and uh, I think commitment to social justice, kind of like your center here, um, it's a time where Latinos, immigrants, and their children are not afraid, I think, to pursue immigrant rights and social justice. I mean, if you think back in the repatriation of the 1930s, when the LA Times front cover said, Hoover blames the depression on Mexican immigrants, and they, you know, they repatriate half a million Mexican immigrants and the US born children, you didn't have a lot of educated uh, Latinos at the time running major uh, legal organizations to fight for the Leo, right. Leo, you're frozen. 
Okay. Oh, sorry. No, now you're you're back. So you didn't have at that time a lot of lawyers, a lot of rights, civil rights organizations run by Latinos who fought for those those repa stop those repatriations. And I would say probably even in the fifties with Operation Wetback, uh, you know, the, the immigrant rights organizations were very nascent, just emerging. Today, obviously, we, there's lawyers, there's organizations, and so the fight for the rights, I think, of immigrants and, and their children is much stronger today than, than in the past. And so, you know, it's a, it's a community of conflicting ideas all the time, just like any community. Um, but at least by state, it varies. In California, I would have to say that the majority of Latinos in California are definitely pro-immigration. Texas is a, is a little harder. <laughs> all right. Okay, so we've got a question from um, Mario Garcia in the chat, and uh, it kind of, in some ways, I suppose, builds on the, the one you just responded to. So he asks, how about in immigrants from Central America? Do they face the same or similar realities? And I suppose just elaborating on that a little bit, I mean, do, do you find um, sort of national origin as, uh, you know, whether people are from, say, Central America or Mexico or other parts of Latin America that you find some differences there. Um, all right, we've also got some other questions and you could you could answer that question right now or I could proceed to the others, maybe whichever you prefer. Well, if you're talking about the Latino threat discourse, uh, Central Americans have been particularly subject to that in very similar ways as, as Mexicans. And when you think particularly about the the, the issue of, of you know why they come to the United States and lumping Central Americans, Salvadorans in particular, and Guatemalans into the gang trope, right? And, and you know the the image of gang members is very popular on, on on many politicians' websites. And so we're protecting you from these gang members, you know, MS13 people, and they're with all their tattoos. And so vote for us. And so they become a trope very similar in a part of what I call the Latino threat, unfortunately. And, um, you know, why are they coming here? And you have, I have actually show a lot of quotes that, you know, these kids are raised in violence. So that's all they know is violence. They're going to come to the United States and just be violent kids and violent people. And, and, and so I think the Central Americans suffer from a lot of the same kind of history of, of anti-Latino tropes that I, I write about, to tell you the truth. Um, some other groups come from Latin America. And um, because the United States isn't as familiar with them as Central Americans and Mexicans, the images aren't quite as bad. I mean, Brazilians, for example, mainly middle class uh, going to the East Coast. Um, uh, and you have you know, Ecuadorians have both you know, working class and people who are more middle class. And so it, it kind of varies by different country, to the truth, uh, who are coming here. But I'd say Central Americans and Mexicans experience a lot of similar tropes about the Latino threat. Great. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Um, I'm first from Leslie Bo, if I pronounced it correctly. I'm going to ask you to um, unmute and you can go ahead and raise your question. Hi, just first of all, thank you so much for that talk. Really generative, really wonderful for my thought. And, and, and I had a question for you that is a bit of a zoom out question to think about the relationship between global economy and immigration in the United States. And I'm fascinated by everything that you're saying, just because I've been working a little bit on China threat theory, you know, and, and one of the responses to China threat theories and the idea of the global supply chain is that, for example, South Korea wants to move its manufacturing more to Vietnam as opposed to China. And, you know, I was thinking a little bit uh, about that in, in regard to the things that you're talking about, about uh, Latino threat. And I'm wondering how this idea of global U.S. dependence on a global supply chain at, in Mexico affects anti-immigrant rhetoric. In other words, what's, what's the relationship between the idea of dependence, right, in this global economy on, on Mexico and then, and especially on the factories that are right across the border. And so th these kinds of um, non-immigrant, but, but Mexican workers who are also going back and forth across the border for, for employment reasons, what's, what's the relationship 
between that idea of global supply chain and, and anti-immigrant rhetoric? Well, I mean, that's a difficult question right now because <laughs> the, the global supply chain is, is undergoing such a major trans transition, as you point out. And, um, you know, it's kind of interesting. If I was writing in the 1850s, my book would have been called The, the Chinese Threat rather than The Latino Threat because the same tropes that occurred against anti-Chinese and anti-Japanese, are I mean, they're, they're basically it's very similar. And even the anti-Southern and Eastern European tropes are very similar. And, um, and so I guess I'm not writing something new, I'm just focusing on a particular group of people where these tropes become very clear. In terms of the you know, global economy, it's always difficult to understand what's going on because the United States finds itself always trying to be competitive in, in the global economy, which has meant since the 1970s, reducing the um, benefits of the labor market in the United States. So lower pay, lower jobs that have pensions, you know, fewer benefits to make us compete with people in Korea and China and other places in, in Mexico, right? And I think that leads to a certain amount of resentment that people are finding, you know, the, the $45, $50 union job, they're gone. Now they're making $10 an hour and the guy who just got here is making $10 an hour. And so a lot of the resentment comes from that. And I think what you also see in relationship to the globalization and global economy is that the United States, you know, as we saw in the, in the most recent um, census, basically is, has every factor that leads to greater pressure for immigration is there. The unemployment is extremely low. Our population is extremely old. Women are having many fewer babies. And, you know, we're, and we're trying to be competitive through production in the world. And it just um, puts pressure on a system to have immigration, which then adds to more resentment <laughs> in the world. Why are they coming, right? Is it gonna destroy my, my gains here? And, and so you have this, the relationship between Korea and the United States is really an interesting one actually, because <laughs> the supply chain there was one that we helped create, particularly after the Korean War, uh, and in many ways. And so, you know, our relationship with Korea has been one where, you know, we benefited greatly by the overproduction of certain kinds of products and certain kinds of professionals. And so, you know, it's no mistake that after the Korean War, we instituted the Johns Hopkins model for medical training in Korea. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's no it's no mistake that Korea overproduced the number of nurses and, and doctors that their, their economy, which was still growing and, and didn't have enough jobs for, had to look elsewhere to work. And where else did, could they work? Well, import substitution. We imported doctors and nurses to work for us at cheaper prices than the doctors we could produce here, just like cars. I mean, so this a global supply chain isn't just in products, it's in people, which I, you know, the United States has never been ashamed to benefit from in terms of global products and people. And so it's, it, you know, what's gonna happen with the current shift over from different places, we'll have to see. But, you know, if one thing Americans are addicted to and is cheap products. And so wherever those products are gonna be built, Mexico or China or, or, or Korea, Japan, New Mexico, the United States is going to take advantage of that and then complain about the fact that somehow we're being cheated. <laughs> and I think that, you know, this resentment that Trump built on, I mean, think about the resentment that Trump built on that, that you know, the Koreans are cheating us, that the Chinese are cheating us, the Mexicans are cheating us. That's, a, that's just a rhetoric of resentment. And yet, you know, any econo economic analysis would say, you know, the benefit from all that to us is just so great. That's why we continue to participate. In these kinds of global exchanges. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great. So we now also have a couple more questions. So the first one from Alfonso. Um, great. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chavez. Um, I was wondering about the survey results that you shared, um, whether or not there was any observed differences between uh, the respondents uh, when it comes to their own demographics. So, you know, if the participants were of different, uh, different age groups or different, you know, formal education uh, or political inclinations, would, 
were, were those things looked at? And if not, would, would, would you think there would be a, an observed difference in the, uh, the way they would respond to the questions uh, posed? Yeah, well, we compared, we were able to compare certain things. These are, first of all, these are all uh, undergraduates. And so the age was relatively narrow, right? 18 to 25 or so. And so when we ran it by age, there really wasn't much difference uh, on that. Um, we ran it by gender and there really wasn't much difference on that either. Uh, and so, yeah, we tried to control for as many variables as we could. Income or perceived relative income to everyone in the United States it did have a certain impact. You know, uh, if you were uh, a little more better off, it seemed to influence how you responded to some of these things. Um, uh, and I, I think basically the timing issue was important because we, you know, we started the study before Trump was elected and it wasn't really focused on Trump. It was just focused on general political rhetoric because he was just an example of 50 years of the same thing, right? But we happened to capture people before the election and after the election, and that was a significant impact because suddenly those who took it after the election realized, well, this person who's been talking so bad, this political rhetoric is now president. And so there, that was a more significant, those, that group had a more significant reaction than once before because when people were sort of taking it as a joke, right, that uh, uh, about Trump. Uh, and so, yeah, we tried to control for a lot of these things. Um, uh, and some of them had some reactions, some of them didn't, but not very much. I thought gender was gonna be much more of the reaction, but it, it wasn't, they kind of evened out. And then someone asked a question over here about the relationship between rhetoric and, um, uh, and directed at other racialized groups. Uh, for example, I noticed a lot of anti-blackness in my own family and the way they expressed pride in being Latino definitely made me wonder how positive how if and how positive community self-worth relates to having some other group to resent and, and that's in, in a society a multicultural society like ours obviously having um, a group that you target as different and lower than you as I think Barbara Aaron Wright kind of mentioned for some people really is is the way they kind of establish their own credibility and sense of pride in, in, in who they are and there's been a lot of work on the fact that the immigrant groups come in, always had African-Americans to judge themselves by and say, well, we're not that bad. <laughs> you know, you don't see us as bad as them, they're down here, right? And, um, and what's interesting, even black immigrant groups who come in uh, from different places like Jamaica and, and Africa often want their kids not to be assimilated into an urban black culture because th that they have this perception somehow that that's, that's, that's weaker and, and less than the culture they're bringing with them because the culture they're bringing with them doesn't have centuries of stigma and antagonism in, in, to it, right? As so they try and hang on to that Im immigrant kind of culture and sense for a long time. It changes relatively quickly because their kids pick up on what they want to pick up on. And among Latinos, of course, it's, you know, you don't, if you just took history as a way of defining identity and relationships, life would be a lot easier because a lot of people don't realize as many Africans came to Mexico as, as Europeans. And so, you know, and Mexico is often not given the kind of credit to its population uh, that, and, and culture that Africans brought to Mexico. And so even the classic mestizo idea is often framed as Indian and Spanish, when in reality, you know, there, were, there was much Mex uh, African blood in Mexico. In fact, one of the conquistadors with Cortez was a, was a free African who came to help as a conquistador, right? And so <clears throat> the problem is because it's been overlooked and denied for so long, and only now in Mexico being, you have conferences and academics talking about Black, Af Black Mexicans, that's becoming much more seen in a positive light. Um, but historically, it hasn't really been part of even the way kids are taught in school. Because I, you know, I interviewed, I talked to a lot of kids growing up in Mexico and say, did you ever hear about black Mexicans? And they said, no, we never heard about that. Even when their presidents, some of the early presidents were part black, right? They didn't, were never told that, right? That contribution was never made into a positive contribution. And so you come here and you, you're in an environment with um, where the competition is often be in, in, in working class neighborhoods between blacks and Latinos, right? without a recognition of a shared history. 
then it becomes much more volatile, much more difficult, I think, to see similarities. And, you know, so let Mexicans in particular have a lot of words that are very much racist words to, to talk about blacks and vice versa, I'm sure. Um, but, I, you know, once again, it just, it goes to the way we talk about people, the kind of rhetoric we use that everybody's susceptible to. I mean, Latinos, Mexican origin people are susceptible to the way we talk about Blacks in society, Asians in society, just as any, anyone else. You know, and I interview immigrants and I talk about race and I say, well, what do you think about this group and this group and this group? And the ones who have the most negative views, I say, do you ever talk to people from those groups? And they go, no. Well, how do you know that? Because before I came, I watched US movies and every movie I see, Blacks are the criminals. You know, this group are the criminals, this group are the drug people. So you know, they, we, we help form a lot of these anti other group images before immigrants even come here, unfortunately. And um, so it's a real, comp I, I wish I could answer your question more clearly, but it's a, it's such a complex issue uh, and one deserves, that deserves a lot of discussion actually. Great, um, so we, the stack is open if anybody else wants to ask a question. Um, you know, and while people are thinking about that, I mean, it, what you just said rem reminded me, I, I don't know if I mentioned this to you before, but years ago we had a, we did a whole semester long series of speakers on Latino politics. And a, a number of them talked about surveys that were done of people who were at least described or labeled as Latino. And one of the interesting um, findings had to do with Dominicans in the Dominican Republic who were asked what was their racial identity and almost nobody identified themselves as of being Afro descendant. Um, and the conclusion from that was that there was such a stigma to being Afro descendant because of Haiti that people didn't wanna identify even though you know, the Dominican population has a large Afro descendant component to it. So um, it seems that, that that's a phenomenon that is true out, even outside of the United States, perhaps. Um, well, I think Latin America also has a slightly different view of race than, than um, uh, colonial American views of, you know, one drop of black blood made you black. And Latin, Latin America, they may not have, because I've read the same studies, a lot of people would just would say, well, uh, those who are black are like pure black as they just arrived from Africa. You know, we've been here a long time. There's a lot of mixture. You know, we, you know, and uh, you know, so to say we're this when and typically they would have a lot of words to describe color, right? Mm. But we're actually here. We're here. We're here, and and a lot of that is a combination of both pigment and social class. You know, which is a lot different, say, than the American point of view, where it's pigment. But in Latin America, social class has a lot to do with how you perceive in terms of of your color, right? And so it's kind of kind of interesting difference. And I think if one of the contributions Latin Americans can bring to the United States is a sense that color, that that race isn't such a black and white issue. That you know, it can be seen as varied. It can be relational, you know, and that sort of thing. But it doesn't mean they're not racist. It just means that it's not the same kind of us them kind of binary that you find in the United States so often. Historically. Very interesting. It looks like Armando has his hand up. Interesting. Yeah, Armando. Oh, thank you, Leo. That was that was fantastic, and I I always enjoy um, listening and learning um, from you, Leo. Uh, the 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 bit about resentimiento, um, this this wound that doesn't heal. Um, what implications would resent does resentimiento have um, to just popular culture in general, knowing? That we are going through this demographic transition, where, where, um, in in that where 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 Latinidad or or the so-called Browning America um, is is changing um, popular culture. So is resentimiento if it's not if if it's something that that um, a, a wound that doesn't heal. How is how do you think this will impact just popular culture in general? In the future, okay. I was using the idea that uh, resentment's a wound that doesn't heal, mainly for the kind of resentment that is is not experienced directly, uh, like that of say the police who don't like these ethnic groups that they have to deal with, and they don't trust them. They think they're going to shoot them, or 
you know, anti-immigrant kind of rhetoric and, and uh, the loss of being white uh, is going down in America. That kind of resentment is typically the one used for a wound that doesn't heal. And, that, and, and no matter what kind of empirical evidence that you can show that people's lives actually get better with immigration, you know, that, that you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't take people's ideas away that somehow they're losing out on this battle. And um, they see it as a battle. In terms of the sentimiento was slightly different because that is an experienced kind of, of, of um, uh, uh, oppression. And that doesn't necessarily mean that is gonna linger. I mean, to get rid of that kind of sense of sensitive emotion is to, be in, is to uh, provide a sense of belonging and, and stop talking about people in stigmat ways that stigmatize them, right? So I think people can, can get over that kind of uh, emotional response if, if like I, as I showed, basically, you give people positive political rhetoric, suddenly they don't feel so resentful. They feel more integrated, more like they're belonging. And so, and so I think what's happening right now, if, if it's the resentment that doesn't heal is so raw that I don't think it's best basically something that's is hopefully as widespread in society as we might think. I, I'm, I hope that it's more localized to a group of crazy people <laughs> or, or misinformed people, but it's so raw that as I tried to point out in terms of, of uh, populist rhetoric by the media or politicians, it's so easy to fan those flames. And I think in the future, what's gonna happen is it's gonna continue. Unfortunately, unless we have a major focus on the fact that this misinformation, that you know, demographic change doesn't destroy us as a people, it just changes us as a people. And that process has been going on for you know, 200 years, right? I mean, there were fears of that, that destruction of whatever was American culture at the moment since the colonial period, right? And yet we've always created something called what it means to be an American out of all the stuff that we're, we're creating now. And I, as an anthropologist, I see that as a positive kind of change, but until people recognize that, I think the resentment uh, coming with people who see demographic change as something they're losing out on is going to be very difficult. And as I pointed out, the, two, the 2020 uh, uh, census shows us that the pressure for more immigration is going to continue. So there's going to be more people coming to the United States, which means those who have that kind of resentment isn't going to go away. I don't think it's going to go in, unless they recognize that when people come here, it's to our benefit because the economy needs them to work. Our culture needs to be re reinvigorated all the time. We need to have new ideas, right? And it's, it's no, you know, to recognize that Nobel, most of our Nobel Prize awards go to immigrants and their children in America. And that means future jobs. That means competitiveness in the world. That means, you know, uh, the, the, that's what keeps us strong. Until people get a sense of that and only focus on pigment, it's going to be a wound that doesn't heal. And unfortunately, I, I don't think, you know, that, that group, fortunately, I, I'm an optimist, um, is great, but they're definitely vocal and they're definitely can be violent. Um, and, uh, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens to the truth. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of that violence occurring really recently and how easy it is to say something like the Chinese flu and then have people being killed and beat up on the street. I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy, you know, and the group that has, you know, despite all the hate with the rhetoric I'm talking about, still African-Americans who have the highest hate, hate crime against them, right? And so, it, you know, how are we gonna stop that? I have no idea, but with the changes that are coming and Latinos becoming really the dominant ethnic group in America, uh, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens. Thank you, Leo. I mean, here at UC Irvine, for example, this negative rhetoric, you know, people say, well, what happens when America changes, be browning of America? My campus is like, whites are like 23% of the campus, right? And uh, I tell people, you know, there's, there's no war here. People get along, you know, people talk to each other. People hang out together. People go out to eat together. You know, people are friends together. We even let a few white people on our basketball team. It's like, you know, we share. And it's like, I don't see what, why, if you take California's example, uh, and, and of course, you know, there is conflict, there are problems, but it's not the level of Armageddon 
that you would take from the kind of rhetoric that's been promoted by the media and the popular press and, and politicians for 50 years. So Alfonso had a, a comment that he just included in the chat. I, I mean, I could read it out or you could read it out, whichever you prefer. Well, it, it kind of goes again, you know, this whole idea of what white means and how Latinos often will claim they're white when they aren't white because we focus on pigment and not, not, not uh, genetics, right, to a certain extent. And but that's true of American culture in general. And, you know, for example, I would say probably most Latinos, particularly from Mexico and Central America, have a great deal of indigenous blood and Af some African blood, even some Jewish blood and, and, and background, um, North African. Uh, and uh, I mean, if, if my genetics can be a guide, I definitely have all of those in me. So when the census comes around every 10 years and asks me what my color is, my race, I always put all or none, your choice. And then I check off Latino. Because the problem is when you have categorizations, categories or classifications that are culturally developed, socially constructed, and you're forcing people to make a choice. And if the stigmatized group is the non-white group, many people are gonna pick white because they don't wanna be in the stigmatized group. And so I think that becomes, a, that's why I'm pretty much against the racial categorization that we find in the census. It's meaningless. It continues to perpetuate stigmatization and categorization. Um, it forces people to, to say they're this, which means they're also saying, I'm not that, right? Which I think is a, is, is a way of denying identity, right? And not, not accepting the fact that they're inside, their, their bodies are a testament to the kind of mixing that's been occurring for 500 years in the new world. And I think that is a, is a danger. I think that's really bad. It's a false identity. It's a false consciousness. And it's one that's being promoted by our own government, right? And it's just really, um, I think it's, it's, it's really too bad. So when, with, with, with um, Armando's question about the future, and, until we can get away from those categorizations, as we change and our demographics change, you know, it's going to force people to want to be the top dog group. So what, what's the point of that? So Kathy has a question where she asks, what do you think are the long-term impacts of a resentimiento in terms of education and wealth development, that is the material impacts? Well, I think what happens here is that if people buy into the fact that you know th this group is somehow undeserving and, uh, and say you have it at the, in terms of education, then, you know, people themselves can be stigmatized. They're, they're often seen as, as, as kids who don't, can't learn, don't want to learn. It's not, it's not surprising that often more likely to be tagged with emotional problems or developmental problems or ADD problems. Um, <laughs> I spent a lot of my youth in grade school outside the classroom because <laughs> I, I talk too much, <laughs> which is kind of you know, my way of doing things, I guess, um, and, and, and less leeway. And so I think if people buy into this idea that this threat is coming and these kids are somehow taking over, it's, 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 it could be detrimental to the education system. Uh, on the other hand, those who are the targets of this, this resentment can also feel like, you know, why am I being left out? Why, for example, did the DACA, was it, why was it so narrowly defined not to include many people? Why were so many millions of people left out? You know, you know what, and their, that future means basically their, their, their future's not gonna be as good as their brother or sister who happened to have, be born one month earlier and qualified for DACA, for example. I mean, and so that, that was resentimiento that they're somehow, you know, this target of this rhetoric that has real political and, and policy implications is very harsh. As I write about in my book, Anchor Babies and, the, and, 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 um, and, and, and Birthright Citizenship, you know, what happens when you're in Texas, you know, which was happening for a while there, I interviewed the lawyer and, and got the um, depositions of many families where their kids were being born, as was typically the custom in many parts of rural America, particularly in rural Texas, were being born with um, at home. And the government decided, well, we're not gonna give you birth certificates because we don't know if you're actually born here or if your parents were legally here. 
And so the, you had hundreds of kids not being given birth certificates. Well, what's that gonna do for you, right? Or it, what happened in Florida for a while until these were all won by lawsuits, which is why I, I brought up earlier that when stuff like this happens now, today, we have enough lawyers and enough people fighting for, for social justice to stop this, right? But it took a while and a lot of people are impacted. Or in Texas, where in one school district, um, uh, they were gonna charge the children of undocumented, of undocumented immigrants foreign student tuition, even though they were US born citizens, because somebody decided, well, they aren't real citizens. I mean, and so, you know, the kind of, impl I guess what I'm saying is we always have to be on guard for people who take it into their, the law into their own hands, whether it's on the border as vigilantes, in a school district, in a county, in a county government, where they're handing out birth certificates, because, you know, things happen like this. And fortunately, you know, we have enough people who pick up on it and, and, and we go to court and we stop it, right? I'm fortunate, I've been fortunate to testify in a number of lawsuits on immigrant rights where you win some, you lose some, but at least there's a fight to stop that. Um, I think I noticed among young people as a professor teaching in college for 30 something years, I've always been impressed by the resilience of those who managed to, to make it. Their fight, I have a grad student right now, she's undocumented and, and she's, you know, she's great. She's doing really good, she's getting a PhD. Not everyone can overcome the obstacles that are placed in front of them, right? Because they can't get oftentimes financial aid. They can't get the kind of thing they have to work so hard in order to keep work to make it. Um, and so they tend to make fall out. They tend not to even finish high school oftentimes, right? And so um, this this leads to what I would say would be you know, you know, a downward mobility to a certain extent among among young people. Um, if we create these obstacles to them. And that's, you know, that is the material disadvantage of this political rhetoric because it affects those who teach people, those who educate, those who go through the system when they don't go to get jobs. I mean, it's just, it's just a domino effect, unfortunately. Great. Um, so are, does anybody else, we have time for another question if people would like, somebody would like to offer one. Um, if not, maybe um, Leo, you have some parting comments for us in the last couple of minutes we've got. No, oh, well, I think uh, next time I hope you invite me so I can come actually out to Madison to see it. <laughs> I've heard so much about how nice it is there. Um, maybe not quite in the middle of winter, but some other time would be great. <laughs> I'd really like to see it. And uh, no, it's wonderful to come twice this year and talk to people it's, it's, um, and get the kind of feedback and questions that are obviously very smart questions. So it's, it's great. And, Great. Uh, well, we we appreciate it deeply, um, and we do hope that someday that that'll be a possibility. Before we uh, let everybody go, I just wanted to remind you what I said at the outset that there are some talks coming up uh, in two weeks. Donna Usmani, John Clegg, and Christopher Lewis will be giving two talks under the title of "Explanatory and Normative Challenges in the Study of Mass Incarceration." That's on March twenty first and March twenty second. We've got talks on Palestine on the militarization in the US and Britain, on um, vaccine avoidance and the crisis of social solidarity amongst a whole bunch of other talks. And so for details on all of those, you can just go to the um, UW-Madison Havens Wright Center for Social Justice website. Um, we put the link in the chat at one point. So um, thanks again to you, Leo. We really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for the wonderful questions you asked. No, thank you, it was great. Have a great right. day. Take Thank care, you. everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.